From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman and welcome to a Cube Conversation. I'm coming to you from our Boston area studio. Happy to welcome to the program, first time guest on the program, Francis Mattis. He is the Vice President of Engineering at Pensando. Francis, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, glad to be here. All right, so Francis, uh, you, you and I actually uh, overlapped uh, you know, in some of the companies we work with. Uh, you know, if anybody familiar with Pensando, uh, you have uh, worked with some of the MPLS team over the years uh, through some of those spin-ins. But uh, for our audience, give us a little bit about your background. You know, what brought you uh, to, to help and uh, be part of the team that uh, you know, started Pensando? Sure, yeah, yeah. So I started my career uh, with advanced micro devices in um, the mid 90s. Uh, got out of school, really wanted to build microprocessors. And, and so AMD being in Austin, Texas, and me going to LSU for undergrad was a perfect um, sort of alignment. And so I got to AMD in Austin, built uh, K5, worked on that team, worked on the team with K7. And, uh, and then I came out to California to help with K8. And that brought me to California. And then that, we got into the dot com era. And, and uh, being at AMD fighting Intel, so to speak, uh, seemed like a hard battle. And so with the dot com era coming, I just uh, saw this perfect opportunity to jump into the internet. And so that's how I got into uh, building internet and uh, data communications equipment. Uh, went to Nishan Systems. Uh, we talked a little bit about that earlier. And that got me into storage. Uh, and from there, I, uh, I got into a company called Andiamo, which was building uh, fiber channel SAN equipment. So I built chips there and uh, got to know the MPLS team there. I always say they hired me off the street. <laughs> and uh, from that point on, well, we've been together since 2001. So uh, 19 years. It'll be, uh, yeah. And i uh, been building silicon with them and systems for almost 20 years now. So wow. we've had quite a journey. Yeah, it's been fun. Great stuff. Yeah, you know, going back, you know, uh, Nishan uh, talking about iSCSI, you know, in the networking world, you know, it's a little bit of a dark arts in general for most people that, you know, understanding the networking protocols and all the various pieces and three and four letter uh, acronyms aren't something that most people are familiar with. Um, Pensando, right. uh, I, I'm curious, you know, you know, networking in general, you're like, I work on internet stuff and we're the tubes that, yeah. uh, you know, things go around. So uh, when, yeah. when you describe Pensando, uh, you know, how do, how do you explain that to the people that maybe aren't deep into east, west, sure, north, yeah. south, uh, over uh, and under uh, underlay protocols? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, for, for me, Pensando was kind of the sort of the culmination of all the things I've, uh, I've done in my career. Um, processing, uh, you know, being able to build uh, compute engines that are programmable, um, starting with microprocessors, um, being able to do storage and storage networking with Andiamo. Uh, we built the computer with Nuova and the virtualization layers around the Ethernet interfaces and the adapter with what was really our first smart NIC. Um, in 2006, 2007 timeframe. And then with SDN and CMA, all of these elements kind of came together, these multiple different layers in the uh, infrastructure stack, if you will. And so Pensando, for me, um, what, what was interesting was the explosion of scale in both uh, space and time with the uh, advent of, let's say, 25 gig, um, 50 gig, 100 gig to the server, um, the uh, notion of very dense uh, computing um, in each rack and the need for very high scale. Um, after doing all of these technologies and seeing where silicon kind of started to fall in place uh, with 16 nanometer, it seemed that bringing this kind of technology to the edge at very low power um, with sort of an end-to-end -end security architecture and end-to-end -end policy engine architecture, distributed services uh, as we're doing, all seem to naturally fit into place. And, and the cloud was already proving this model. When I say the cloud, I mean the hyperscalers like Amazon and, and Microsoft were already building these platforms. And so it, it dawned on me that uh, 
I didn't think that this was possible unless you built the entire platform, you built the entire system. If you built any one piece, the market transition would take a lot longer. And I think this is true in, in technology history. It tends to repeat itself, starting with mainframes when IBM built the entire computer and DEC built the entire computer and HP built, HP built. So these kinds of things um, are important if you want to really push a market transition. And so Pensando became this opportunity to, to take all of these things that I've done in, in my past life and bring them together in a way that would give a complete stack uh, for the purposes of, of what I call the new computer, um, which is basically the data center. And so, um, you know, when my mom asks me, you know, what is it that you're doing? I, I said, well, it's just imagine the computer you have right now um, and multiply them by thousands and thousands, stack them in a rack, and uh, anyone can use it at any one time. And we provide the infrastructure and the mechanisms to be able to, to uh, orchestrate and control that uh, at the very, at the very uh, high speed layers. So I don't know if that was a long answer. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, uh, and, you, you know, when I, when I look at the industry, uh, you know, cloud, of course, is that you know, just mega wave that changed the, the way a lot of people uh, look at this, the way we architect things. Um, there was this belief for a number of years, well, you know, I'm going to go from this complicated mess that I had in my own data centers and cloud was going to be, you know, inexpensive and easy. Um, and I don't think anybody thinks about inexpensive and easy when they look at cloud computing these days, then add edge into these environments. So I, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, today's environment, you know, we know IT always is additive. So uh, I have various pieces that I need to put together. You talked about building platforms and, you know, how, how, how can it be a complete stack? So, you know, companies like Oracle, you know, for many years said, we can do everything from the silicon all the way up through your application. Amazon in many ways yeah. does the same thing. They can, you can build everything Absolutely. with Amazon, but they built out their ecosystem. So how does yes. Penn Sando fit into this, you know, multi-cloud, multi-dimensional, multi-vendor world? Absolutely, yeah. So that's a good, <laughs> yeah. so good, good question. So, um, so one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to uh, bring a, a systematic management layer to heterogeneous computing. And what I mean by that is um, in, in any enterprise data center, modern data center, you're going to have multiple types of computing. You're going to have virtual machines. You're going to have bare metal and you're going to have uh, containers, or at least in the last, say, three or four years, chances are you'll have some containers and, and moving there. And so uh, what we wanted to do was be able to provide an infrastructure, a, a management mechanism, uh, where all of these heterogeneous types of computing could be managed the same way with respect to policy. And what I mean by policy is um, sort of this declarative or intent-based model of I, I declare what I'd like to see, um, whether that be network policy or end to end security with data in motion um, and, and be able to plot, apply it in a distributed manner across these different types of heterogeneous elements. The cloud has the advantage that it's homogenous for the most part. I mean, they own the entire infrastructure and they can control everything on there. Now, our systems will obviously manage the homogenous systems as well. And in many ways, that's easier. Um, but bringing together these, this notion of heterogeneous types of computing with one management plane, uh, one type of interface for the operator, um, specifically the networking services operator, uh, was fundamental. That, and then the second thing is being able to bring the scale and speed to the edge. So uh, a top of rack switch or something in the, in the middle of the network is obviously very dense in terms of its IO capability. So the silicon area that you spend uh, in building a high speed switch is really spent for the most part on the IO. Uh, that's typically 30 to 40% of the area will be IO. And the rest will be very much hardwired control protocols. We know that as we go to SDN services and we want, uh, let's say, software defined mechanisms in terms of what the policy looks like, what the protocols look like, the ability to change over time uh, in the lifespan of the computer, which is three to five years, uh, you want that to be programmable. Very difficult to apply at very dense scale in the core of the network. And so it was an obvious move to bring that to the edge uh, where we could plug it into the server effectively, just like we did really in uh, the UCS system uh, with Nova or Cisco. 
Yeah. Yeah, um, some some really tough engineering challenges. You know, for for the longest time, it was very predictable in the networking world. You know, you go from one gig to ten gig. You know, there was little discussion how we went the next step, whether you know twenty five, fifty, you know forty, and and, and hundred gig now. But you, you talk about containerized architectures. You talk about distributed systems with edge. Things change at a much smaller, granular level and change much more frequently. So. You know, what are some of the design principles and challenges that you make sure that you're ready for what's happening today, but also knowing that, you know, technology changes are, you know, always coming and you need to be, right. uh, you know, able right. to handle, uh, you know, that next thing. That's right. Yeah. So uh, the, I think pr part of the biggest challenges we have are around power um, with respect to the design um, power and then um, what is the uh, usefulness of each transistor? So um, when you uh, you have a sort of a scale of flexibility, CPUs are the most flexible, um, obviously, but have probably the least uh, performance uh, in them. Uh, FPGAs are pretty useful in terms of its flexibility, but uh, not very dense in terms of its um, logic capability. And then you have hardwired ASICs which are uh, extremely dense, very much purpose-built um, logic, but completely inflexible. And so the, the design challenge that was put in front of us is how do we uh, find that sweet spot of extremely programmable, extremely flexible, um, but still having a cost profile that didn't look like an FPGA and uh, got us the benefits of the CPU. And, and that's where this sort of this notion of domain specific processing came in, which is, OK, well, if we're going to solve a few problems and we're going to solve them well. And those few problems are going to be we're going to bring PCIe services, we're going to bring networking services, we're going to bring storage services, and we're going to bring security services around the edge of the computer so that we can offload or, let's say, partition correctly the computing problem in a data center. And to do that, we knew uh, a, a, a core of CPUs wasn't going to do the job. That's basically borrowing from this guy to pay this other guy, right? So what we wanted to do was bring this notion of domain-specific processing. And that's where our design challenges came in, which is, OK, so now we, we, we build around this language called P4. Uh, what is the most optimal way to um, pack the most amount of threads or processing elements into the silicon while managing the memory uh, bandwidth, which is obviously, um, you know, packet processing is, uh, have, has been said to be uh, embarrassingly parallel, which is true. However, the memory bandwidth is insane. And so um, how do we build a system that uh, ensures that memory is not the bottleneck? Um, obviously, we're producing a lot of data. We're uh, computing a lot of data. And so, so these were some of our design challenges. All of that within a, a power envelope uh, where this part or this device could sit at the edge inside of a computer within a typical power profile of a PCIe uh, attached card in a modern computer. So that was a huge design challenge for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear, you know, it, it was a multi-year journey uh, to, to, to launch uh, the solution. Um, you know, I, I think of the old world, it was, you know, very much a hardware-centric 18 to 24 months uh, for design, you know, all the tape outs you need to do on this. Uh, sounds like, you know, obviously there is still hardware, but it is more software-driven uh, than it would have been, you know, 10 years ago. So g give us some of the ups and downs yeah. uh, in that journey. Love to hear any, any stories that you can share there. Well, yeah, I think, you know, good question. Uh, it's always, there's always ups and downs in anything you do, uh, especially in a startup. And um, I, I think one of the, the biggest challenges we, we've, we've faced um, is uh, the exact hardware software um, boundary. So what is it that you want in hardware? What is it that you want in software? And, uh, you know, one, one of the greatest assets in our company um, in Pensando are the people. We have uh, amazing software and hardware architects um, who work extremely well together because most of us have been together for so long. So, um, so that always helps when you start to partition the problem. Uh, we spent the first year of Pensando, which was basically 2017 when the company was founded, really thinking through this problem. What it, for, for all the problems we wanted to solve, 
uh, the goals that were given to us, end-to-end -end security. Okay, so I want to be able to uh, terminate TCP and uh, initiate TLS connections. What's the right architecture for that? Um, I want to be able to do storage offload and be able to provide encryption of data at rest, data in motion. I want to be able to do compression, these kinds of things. What's the right hardware software boundary for that? What do we, what do we hardwire in silicon versus what do we make programmable in silicon, obviously, but still through a computing engine? And so we spent the first year of the company really thinking through those different partitioning problems. And, and that was definitely a challenge. I mean, we spent a lot of time in, in, in uh, you know, meet conference rooms on whiteboards, figuring that out. And then 2018, the challenge there was now taking this architecture, this sort of technology substrate, if you will, that we built, and then executing on it, making sure that it was actually going to yield what we hoped it would, uh, that we would be able to provide the services. And we talk about uh, L4 firewall at line rate that's completely programmable. Uh, did we achieve that? Can we do load balancing? Can we do all of, would this P4 processing engine and the innovations we brought to P4 satisfy all of these um, requirements we had put for us? And so 2018 was really about execution. And, and there you always have the challenges in execution in terms of, you know, you know things are going to go wrong. It's, it's not, it's not uh, if, it's when. And then uh, how do you deal with it? And so again, uh, I would say, the biggest challenge in, in execution is uh, containing the changes. You know, it's so easy for things to, to change, especially when um, you're trying to really build a software platform, right? Um, because it's, it's always easy to sort of kick the can and say, we'll deal with that later in software. But we know that given what we're trying to do, which is build a system that is highly performant, um, you, you can't kick that can. You have to deal with it when it comes. And so uh, we spend a lot of time doing performance analysis, uh, making sure that all these applications we were building um, were going to, to yield the right performance. And so that was quite of a challenge. And then 2019 was kind of the year of shaping the product, um, really lots of product design. OK, now that we have this technology and it does these pieces that we want it to do, these pieces, meaning these services, um, what are all the different ways we can shape this product? After talking to customers for you know months and months and months, uh, as you know, Sony is very much customer driven, customer centric. So we we were um, fortunate enough that we got to spend a lot of time with customers, and then that brings us out of challenges, right? Because uh, every customer has uh, unique problems, and so uh, how do we how do we form this product around um, a, a solution that that solves? Quite a bit of problems that, that really brings value, and so that was the uh, th those were the challenges in 2019, uh, which we overcame. Now, obviously, we have uh, uh, several releases that we've come out with already. We've got the ASICs and the chips, and the it's all there now. So now 2020, uh, unfortunately, COVID's here, but um, this is this is our year of growth. This is the year that we really uh, bring it out into the world with our partners and our customers, and, and show how this technology has been. Uh, developed and benefit will benefit customers over over the next years, two years. Yeah. Well, Francis, really appreciate the insight there. Yeah, that that discussion of the hardware versus software uh, brings back memories for me. Lots of heated debates uh, as to That's where right. that yeah, is. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. one of the lines uh, you know we've used on the cube many times is you know you know software will eventually work and hardware will eventually break. So uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, Mario, absolutely those, uh, those trade offs Mario, that we always uh, have to look at. Me, taught me something a long time ago. He said that um, uh, hardware is hard to change, software is hard to stop changing. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, no, that that that, uh, that 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 that's a great one too. All right, so yeah, you gave us yeah. through the last three years uh, journey. Give us a little bit look, you know, on, on, on the next three years and, and where you expect Pensando to be going. Sure, where where I see Pensando in the next three years as we go through this market transition is uh, um, both a, a market leader and a thought leader in in terms of um, the next wave of of uh, data center edge computing, uh, whether it be. Uh, uh, in, in the service provider space, whether it be in, in the enterprise space or whether it be in the, in the, in the cloud space, the hyper, hyperscaler space. Um, as I was mentioning at the beginning, um, when, we had, when we were talking about uh, the journey, market transitions of this nature um, really require understanding the entire stack. If you provide a piece 
um, and someone else provides a piece, you will eventually get there. Um, but it's a matter of when. And by the time you get there, there's probably something new. So, you know, uh, time in and of itself is an innovation in this area, especially when you're dealing with a market transition like this. And so we've been fortunate enough that we're building the entire system. I mean, we go from the transistors to the RESTful APIs. We, we, we have the entire stack. And so uh, where I see us in three years is uh, not only being um, a market leader in this space, but also uh, being the thought leader in terms of uh, what does domain specific processing look like at the edge? Um, you know, uh, what are the tools? Uh, what are the uh, techniques um, for really, as we say, democratizing the cloud, bringing, bringing this technology uh, to everyone? Excellent. Well, hey, Francis, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the journey so far and can't wait to Thank see you. How, how things progress yeah. going forward. Yeah, we're excited and I appreciate it. Thank you for your time too. All right. Check out thecube.net. We've got lots of back catalog uh, with, with Pensando also. I'm Stu Miniman and thank you for watching The Cube.